بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين My dear brothers, my dear and respected sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I would like to welcome you again to this beautiful Sunday breakfast we're having every week. Alhamdulillah, we are blessed with many brothers and sisters who have been coming every Sunday, enjoying their breakfast first, and then we all share some uh, uh, insight and in an informative session. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all, to protect you all, and to guide us all to his uh, path. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa la antaqfu ma laysa lanka bihi ilm inna as-sam'a wal-basara wal-fu'ad lu'ulaika kana anhu mas'ula One of the great lessons Islam teaches is always seek the truth and make sure you do not follow the falsehood. Now, falsehood could have so many forms. One of the forms that falsehood can take shape with is Myths and superstitions. Islam always wants us to follow what is real, what is logical, what is scientific, what has a scientific base. Anything that is baseless, anything that has no scientific base, and when I mean, when I say scientific, I don't necessarily mean that it is physics or chemistry. Anything that it is rooted in the truth, in reality. You follow it. And if something has no logical base, we're not supposed to follow. We're not supposed to follow, for example, rumors. Rumors are baseless. They have no solid ground. Someone says something. Someone throws a word. And I just repeat it. And you know, a lot of times, a lot of times, what you hear, many things we hear, we read in the newspapers, or now on Facebook, social media, WhatsApp. Most of it is not true. Most of it is false, my dear brothers and sisters, because it has no base. Someone said something. Okay, where is the source? Where did he get this from? Nobody knows. Facebook. So what is Facebook? It's another Quran that we have to follow? Or I got this into in my WhatsApp yesterday. So what's the origin? What is the legitimate source behind this there is no legitimate source islam wants us to be smart not to follow anything we do. allah says in this ayah wala taqfu do not follow wala taqfu ma laysa laka bihi ilm do not follow things that you have no certainty of i'm not certain if i'm certain i would follow if someone trustworthy tells me something, I can follow. But just because it was in the social media or in WhatsApp or even in new, some newspapers, this is not a justification for me to follow and to accept or to even embrace. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, one of the problems Islam faced 
when it first appears is people following myths and superstitions. And every time the Quran tried to awake people to the fact that superstitions are just superstitions, myths are myth, myths, they cannot be any base for scientific work or thought. Islam was encountered by stubbornness of people. If you read the history of the Arabian Peninsula before, the practice of superstitions was so widespread, so widespread. I give you some examples. When one of them under any city and he fears that he could be infected with an epidemic or any disease. So what was the immunization method? The immunization method, and I'm serious, this is in the history, in history books, that he would stand at the outskirt of that particular city or town and he would imitate the donkey in his sound. He tries to make the sound of a donkey, thinking this could be a good recipe for staying immune from any epidemic or disease. Or they thought when someone felt hungry, why do you feel hungry? They say the reason you feel hungry, they seriously believe that there is a snake in your stomach, hidden in your stomach. It starts biting your stomach from within, and that's why you feel the pain. And so many others. When someone would travel, and traveling at that time was filled with risks and dangers. You know, you're traveling in the camel for several weeks, right in the heart of the deserts. There are thieves, there are, you know... Uh, predators, there are diseases. So they think in their imagination that every area, every county, for example, every desert had a patron, and the patron is from jinn. So they would stand at night and they appeal the, to that imaginary jinn that please leave me alone, do not come me near me, do not harass me, and I promise you, I will not do anything to you. I will respect you as well. So, and then they start their journey. They travel. Even now, my dear brothers and sisters, even after what, 14 centuries after the advent of Islam, there are so many myths exist in the, among Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Many of us believe in so many myths. Many of us, for example, believe that number 13 is a cursed number. I've seen it myself in some airplanes as you are, you know, uh, given a seat to be seated. So there is row 11, 12, 14. They skip number 13. And when you ask is that, uh, it's a cursed number. I'm afraid to sit on row number 13. Why is that? I don't know. Maybe uh, I could be doomed if I sit there. This is a myth. This is a myth that we live in the 21st century and many people believe in it. And so on and so forth. Islam says, you Muslims to need to be better educated, emphasizes education. There is no holy book, or I can say there is no book at all, no text, that sanctify education as much as the Quran does. There are many verses in the Quran encourages Muslims to seek education, to be educated, and to always use our brain. Inna fi thalika la ayatin liqawmin yaqilun. Inna fi thalika la ayatin 
لِأُولِلْ الْأَلْبَابِ أَفَلَا يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Why don't you use your mind, your brain? Allah gave you a beautiful gift called brain. Use it. Use it. Some people do not use their brain. They make sure it, is sta it stays intact and used and they follow other people whatever other people tells them they follow without even analyzing a bit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you this very sophisticated device that is called the brain equipped with over 14 billions billions of cells Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you a distinguished being in this, on this earth through this brain. What does make me different from, you know, any other animal? Animals also eat, they drink, they have instinct. But what they don't have, they do not have the brain, the type of brain you and I have. They do not uh, analyze, they do not think. They are not capable of <coughs> reduction, for example. They are not capable of being intellectual. God has given you this gift for a reason, for you to use it, not to put it on the shelf. So one way, one way to fight superstition myths is by using our brain. So, Islam says, follow everything logical. Do not follow what is baseless, what is considered a myth that has no historic or real basis at all. No scientific basis at all. My dear brothers and sisters, there is a philosophy his name is Ibn Rushd. He's from Spain. He is Muslim, of course. Part of the Muslim Andalusia. When Muslims lived in, in, uh, in Spain. And over maybe 400 centuries ago. You know, the year America was discovered, 1492. The, uh, the Spain Muslims, unfortunately, the Muslim reign in, in Spain ended by the same year. For after eight centuries of ruling Spain, turning Spain into an oasis of knowledge, education, and prosperity, unfortunately, the reign ended. So there is a philosopher from Muslim Spain, his name is Ibn Rushd. He says, if you want the mobs to follow you, all you need to do is to give some religious flavor to your agenda and they will follow you blindly. Mobs do not think, do not use their brain. They use what? Their vision only. In other words, their brain is not here in their head. Rather, it is in their vision. They do not analyze. They are dominated by emotions and they just follow. They follow without thinking, without analyzing. Islam says, no, you can't do this. You cannot let people follow superstitions. Let me give you one simple example. <clears throat> one day, the son of the Prophet ﷺ, his name is Ibrahim, from his Egyptian wife, Mary. Mary the Coptic. The Prophet had a son. His name is Ibrahim. He died when he was three years old. When Ibrahim died, the same exact day, there was a solar eclipse coincided with the death of Ibrahim. 
So what did people say? They say, look, the son of the prophet died and there is eclipse. In other words, they were trying to say that this solar eclipse place as a reaction to the death of the Prophet ﷺ. Otherwise, why it happens in that specific day that there is a solar eclipse when the son of the Prophet. In other words, what people were trying to say that the universe reacted in pain in sorrow for the death of the Prophet, <coughs> for the death of the son of the Prophet by having solar eclipse. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <clears throat> now obviously <clears throat> this will suit politicians if the prophet was a politician he would enjoy that he would enjoy hearing that yeah yeah of course there is a solar eclipse because of my son's death if the prophet وسلم, was like any other politician he would take advantage of this naivety of people. He would say, yeah, that's true. <clears throat> the sun was eclipsed because of my son's death. But what did the prophet say? The prophet went to the masjid, took to the member pulpit, and he says, Ayyuhannas. Listen to me, people. Inna shamsa wal qamar ayatani min ayatillah. لا تنخسفان ولا تنكسفان لوت أحد من الناس. He says, sun and moon are two signs of God, and they will never be eclipsed for any of these death, including my son. If the sun is supposed to be eclipsed because of some people's death, then that means we should have more than. 300, 400 solar eclipse every year. Because every now and then, a famous guy, an important guy dies. No. Allah doesn't work that way. Those are, those are universal signs that will not be affected by anybody's death. And the Prophet immediately stopped that rumor, that myth, that the Sun is eclipsing because of the sun of the Prophet. ﷺ. It doesn't work that way. Even though he could have exploited people's naivety and people's ignorance, but he didn't. He didn't because he wanted people to be educated and smart and distinguish between what is fact and what is rumors, between the truth and myths. So, Islam constantly advise people to always follow the path of logic, the path of certainty. So, I want to give, give some examples on how Islam refuses, refuses that Muslims embrace myths, and superstitions. Number one, one of the widespread and widely common myths that exist up till now among Muslims is believing in dreams. Believing in dreams. And you may say, what? Believing in dreams? So dreams are not true? I tell you 99%, 99% of your dreams, with all due respect to you, are nonsensical. So all those dreams I have been seeing in my are nothing. Yeah, they are nothing. So how? How is that possible? very possible you know sometimes we overeat and you know we go to sleep before giving ourselves some time for our food to digest and that reflect in the form of nightmares 
we go to our bed set depressed over something over a loss whether physical loss or non-physical loss and we see dreams bad dreams that doesn't mean those dreams mean anything sometime i'm overjoyed because i won the lottery and start seeing myself i'm flying in the space because i won say three million dollars in the lottery that doesn't mean you're going to go to the moon that doesn't mean anything is that you won the lottery and you were overexcited and that excitement reflected itself in your dreams. Trust 50% of calls come to any center. It's about dream interpretation. Say it, I saw this in my dream. I want you to interpret. I said it many times. <laughs> before I do not interpret dreams. And some people think I'm being humble. No, I'm not being humble. I'm not being humble. I'm just telling you, I don't believe in dreams. So if you have any dream, come to 263054. <laughs> Go somewhere else. Maybe they will help you. I do not believe in dreams. I don't mean that all dreams are false. No. There is very, very small, very small percentage of a dreams that could be true. Very small percentage. But as I said earlier, 99.99% of our dreams are nonsensical. Either because it's a reaction, either because I was uh, saddened, depressed, or I was overjoyed, or I ate too much kibbaniya the night. This happens. So, I should not really make a big, you know, fuss about dreams. Some people are even obsessed with their dreams. Every single day they see dreams, they want someone to interpret their dreams. This is nonsensical. Nonsensical. Some people seriously believe in their dreams blindly. Let me give you an example. Some time ago, a friend of mine, he came and he says, Sayyid, you know this guy? He mentioned someone's name. I said, yeah, he's a good man. He says, no, 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 he's not a good man. I said, why? I know he's a good man. He says, because I saw this guy in my dream, looking like a pig. So, if you saw him in the dreams looking like a pig, he becomes a pig? I mean, what kind of conclusion that is? Or someone says, I saw my father in my dream telling me that, say, X or Y owes me $2,000. So, what do you do next day? next day you go to x or y and ask him to pay you two thousand dollars i mean on what basis on the basis of a dream dream means nothing dreams has no consideration and no value when it comes to facts so we should not follow our dreams or the outcome of our dreams or i saw my mom told me don't go to your sister's house because she is uh, she uses narcotic I mean that's not I cannot I cannot rely on something like this because someone told me in my dream or someone looked like this in my dream this is one thing one problem that is so common among people among people Especially our community, in our community. And uh, this is something that we need to tackle, my dear brothers and sisters. So, the other thing, the other superstition we have in our community that whenever there is a problem in our house, especially problem between 
you know, my daughter and her husband, or between my son and his wife. The fastest and the most convenient conclusion many people make is someone had made them uh, magic, black magic, black magic, sihr, sorcery. No way. They were very good with each other a month ago. Now, look, she cannot handle each other. They cannot even look at each other. And they blame it on who? On the jinnis. I'm going to the jinnis soon. And those are the jinnis who are doing this. Jinnis have nothing to do with your daughter and her husband. Trust me. The problem between my daughter and my son-in-law has nothing to do with jinnis. Or it has to do with any person writing them, you know, dark magic or black magic. People have enough things in their hand to think about you or your daughter or your son-in-law. Who cares? Who cares about me to write sahar again? Who cares? Do I really think that I am the center of this world? That if I'm successful or I am thriving, all people are looking at me and they are they are envy of me and envious of me and they don't want me to progress and that's why they have basically dedicated all their powers and resources to stop me even by committing black magic? Come on, let's not exaggerate. Let's not exaggerate. You don't know what's between your daughter and husband because sometimes they don't tell you what is happening? They don't share all these secrets. So if something happens, if someone, if something happens, that doesn't mean are uh, are are behind it. It could be something internal that you don't even know. <clears throat> so let's no, not go after jinnis. Trust me, my dear brothers and sisters. There are many people think that, you know, the whole community is looking at them, scrutinizing them, and there are 1,000 people in the community who wants to do them harm by writing them sihr. That's not true. Well, you may have some enemies, but I think your enemies have business also to do. They are not that, you know, Ridiculous to do nothing but to go and do sihr. Let's say, let's say they did sihr for you. Who told you the sihr is so effective? Who told you sihr and sorcery would work? Who said? What is the proof on that? If you go to someone on Dix Avenue and you pay him three hundred dollars and he will write you, you know. That guy will die immediately. Show me. Show me a proof. Show me a proof. If that would work, the U.S. would not dedicate 12, 13 million dollars for one operation to kill Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. They would do him a sorcery and he would die immediately. So, why would we go? I mean, who said sorcery would really affect you and harm you? Who said if someone did sihr against you, it will work? Who said? Even the Quran says you cannot harm anybody except with God's permission. With God's permission. If God does not permit, it's not going to happen. I should not be that naive that I think anything happens to me, then anything bad happens to me, there should be a sihr or ayn. Someone jealous of me and they did this to me. Ayn does exist, by the way. Ayn that does exist. And inshallah, I will talk about it. In other words, the, what do they call the bad eye or? Huh? Evil eye. It does exist. 
and I'm going to talk about it another day, in another day, inshallah. But it is not to that extent that everything happens to me, every problem happens to me. Then there is an evil eye on me. Who are you? You're not Tom Cruise. You're not, I don't know, George Clooney. So you think you are very famous, that everybody is following you, chasing you, wants to harm you. Who am I to think that way? So my dear brothers and sisters, we need to be a little bit more educated when it comes to our psychological and sometimes some of our psychiatric problems. Some people come to me telling me I have Ain. Okay, how? Says because I've been hallucinating lately. Okay, if you hallucinate, then go and see a psychiatrist. <laughs> Sayyid, are you telling me I'm a crazy? <laughs> no, you're not a crazy. But you just said you're hallucinating. <laughs> if you, and if you're hallucinating, you have to go and see a psychiatrist. Don't come to Qazwini. Qazwini will not help you. So this is a problem that exists in our community. Someone is having depression. I talked about this before. Go to Qazwini. What does Qazwini do to you? Well, religion can solve my problem. Religion can solve your problem by referring you to the right person. How come when you have a problem, in, when you have an ulcer in your stomach, you don't come to me? You go to your family doctor. But when you have depression, you come to me. So why don't you apply the same norm? When you have an ulcer, also come to me and say Islam solves all our problems. You go to the doctor. You go to internal medicine doctor. And they write you prescription. Same thing. When you have depression, you need to go to a doctor who is not specialized in internal medicine in psychiatry or psychologist and they will prescribe you uh, medicine now scholars research say that those who have depression they suffer from chemical imbalance that doesn't mean are crazy or insane chemical imbalance just like when you have an ulcer in your stomach you suffer from a certain physical imbalance that leads to this ulcer you take a medication and it helps. Same thing. Same concept. Go to the doctor. Go to the psychiatrist. Or go to the, to the psychologist. They will prescribe you medicine and you will be okay. And that is the role of Islam. Allah put this healing. Healing nature in the medicine. So Allah says to you, go and use medicine. Go to the doctor. Qazwini will not help you much. A sheikh will not help you much. Maybe he will help you 10%. There is another myth that if you're faithful, if you have strong faith, you should not have any depression. Who said that? Who said that? That's not true. No, that's not true. Depression can strike any person, religious on, or non-religious, because it has nothing whatsoever it has nothing to do with your faith and with your iman it is a chemical imbalance that occurs in your brain it has nothing to do with your religion it has nothing to do with your faith and it is wrong to tell someone who is suffering from depression don't go to doctors don't take their medicine go to allah and pray yes pray, pray to allah but that doesn't mean you don't go to the doctor. Go to the doctor. Go to the doctor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened that way for us. A doctor is an instrument. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the healer. Shifa min Allah. But the doctor does his job. And you need to go to the doctor. So... Having said this, my dear brothers and sisters, there are many myths that sometimes tear families up. And instead of them seeking, seeking, you know, proper treatment, 
they go after some of those crooks who operate somewhere in a dungeon and they charge people and significantly and then they deceive people that your problem is with me come to me I will I will uh, help you no don't listen to those people those people are interested in your wallet and your money and your cash when you have a medical problem go and seek medical treatment so this is another myth that many people believe in also my dear brothers and sisters there are certain practices that sometimes we do and they are also based on myth when you hear something impresses you you knock on the wood what's this what's this what's this what is the origin of this practice Ashura, if it's Ashura, you're not supposed to move into new house. That's not true. That's not true. You're not supposed to chew gum. So what does Imam Hussein has to do with your gum? Get it? Imam Hussein revolted 14 centuries ago, so you don't chew a gum today? That's a myth. Yes, I understand that we need to be mournful during Ashura. We need to show respect to the, the Prophet. We need to look not too excited during Ashura because as you don't look so excited and jubilant when you have a loss of family, you're not supposed to look so jubilant during the loss of the family of the, family of the Prophet. But this has nothing to do with not moving into new house. Many ladies call me and say that I was going to the mall today to purchase something and they, my friend told me you're not supposed to go to the mall during Ashura. That's not a true. That's not a true. That's a myth. We need to be better at it. Imam Hussein did not die so you stop going to the mall. Imam Hussein didn't die so you stop moving into new house. Imam Hussein died so he would inspire us inspire us in standing up against aggression and injustice that's the whole philosophy that's the whole purpose is to teach us that dignity is more precious than any meat, any sandwich any meal your dignity comes first and when tyrants try to trample over your dignity, you're not supposed to accept or tolerate that. Stand up even if it costs you your own life. This is the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. It is not about chewing gum or not moving into a new house. My dear brothers and sisters, before I conclude, I would like to remind you one more time and the last time about the dinner for the orphans. Hajanada, do you have a ticket? Please hand me one. There is a dinner taking place this coming Friday at Nadi Vintage Bill. And it is aimed at helping and supporting the orphans Shukran, thank you so much. Sister Salama, thank you. Sister Laura handed me one. So it is aimed at, at supporting the orphans in Karbala. Many of you have been to Karbala during that trip, and inshallah, by the way, we are going this uh, uh, December, December 21st. We are all going, inshallah, to Ziara, and we will be praying for you. So uh, the orphanage in Karbala that uh, supports over 6,000 orphans, 6,000 orphans. They need our help. And orphans are orphans, my dear brothers and sisters, regardless where they live, regardless what religion they have, what color they have. Our religion teaches us to care for orphans, period. So I encourage you, all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, if you have not purchased your ticket, 
tickets are sold here by the uh, sister uh, Iman at the bookstore and in our uh, uh, at the reception area and make sure you buy those tickets for yourself for your family members and join us in the uh, fundraising dinner on Friday at 6 p.m. right 6 p.m. at Nadi Bintaj Bail inshallah Allahumma gfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat tabi' Allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat innaka mujibud da'awat innaka ala kulli shay'in qadir wa ila arwah al mu'minina wal mu'minat naqra' surah al mubarakah al fatiha Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, also, my dear brothers and sisters, I would like to ask you to recite Surah Al Mubarakat Al Fatiha on behalf of a dear brother, dear friend, a respected member of our community who was in a vacation in Egypt and he drowned in the ocean, Al Marhum Haj Abdullah Hama, whose body will be. Uh, arriving I think either today or tomorrow morning and his funeral will be held tomorrow at ICA so uh, I would like to ask uh, all of us to recite Surah Al Mubarakat Al Fatiha on his on his behalf. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Hajj.